Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this lovely venue. My name is Gary Thurlow. I'm from Quite Center. It's my pleasure to come here tonight and see this lovely event. It's nice for us from the Writer Center to venture out most of our book launches, and we're approaching 50 now, that take place in Limerick City and around the Hunt Museum, the lovely venue, so is the Lock Bar, but this is a lovely venue too. So we're delighted to come, sort of come out on tour and certainly to come to uh, Michael's home writing area. So that's, that's good for us too. A couple of little housekeeping things first. Wouldn't be the end of the world, but if you could switch your phones off, it would be good. I always think sometimes there's an awful fuss fade if somebody's phone goes off, but it happens. But if you can, it would. And a second piece of housekeeping, there's a camera over there which is video in the event. So if you could help, not standing in front of it or walking through it. We're here tonight to, to launch this lovely book. And um, I'm, I'm sure we're going to have a nice evening. Um, uh, Michael has, has been very shrewd in asking someone of great note to launch the book for him. And David will be speaking later. But we're going to start. and. Uh, He's not particularly well, he's got a bad leg, so he'll stagger up to the mic. The director of Limerick Writer Centre, Dominic Taylor. Thanks, uh, thanks a million, Donald. And thanks again to uh, all of you for coming out here tonight to, to celebrate the publication of Mike's book, Save to Memory, Last of You. As publishers of uh, Save to Memory, Last of You, I just want to set out the role uh, of the Limerick Writer Centre. Since 2008, uh, we've tried to bring ideas about books, literature, and writing to as wide an audience as possible, and especially, perhaps, to people who do not feel very comfortable in traditional arts, uh, literature, venues, or settings. Elvira Lindu, the Spanish writer and journalist, writing about Frank McCourt a few days after his death in Spain's leading cultural newspaper, El País, said that McCourt spent three decades inoculating young people with the sweet venom of literature. Now, such a poetic statement might well be the mission statement for the work of the Limerick Writer Centre. The book we are launching tonight is the 47th title the Limerick Writer Centre has published since 2008 under its community publishing initiative. Now, I'm sure a lot of you are aware that increasingly more these days, for writers to maintain the integrity of their work and to get their work published in book form is very difficult, especially with the large uh, publishers who now control a significant amount of all books published in Europe and America. And as uh, one of our own local poets, Kirana Driscoll, remarked recently on a radio programme, these publishers are not run by literary editors, but by marketing people. And basically, for them to publish a book, uh, especially a new author, um, the book will have to conform to what they believe the market wants. At the Limerick Writer Centre, we share the belief that writing and publishing should be made both available and accessible to all. We try as much as possible to represent diverse voices and advocate for increased writing and publishing access to individuals and groups that have not typically had this access. Importantly also, we believe that the author should remain in control of their work which means that they have a direct say in how the book is produced, where and how the books are ultimately sold and distributed. We believe that the labor that goes into writing the book should not be appropriated by publishers who then determine the use value of the fruits of that author's labor. We argue, what we argue for is a new model of aesthetic and cultural production and appreciation that retains the integrity of the creator of the product. At the Limerick Writers' Center, we also, took, we also tried to promote writing done by ordinary people, people who may are not trained writers and may struggle to get their ideas down on paper. We value difference and welcome people who may lack confidence in themselves and their writing ability. Through our readings, workshops and writer groups, we encourage people to write and read their work to each other. In short, our aim is to spread a consciousness of literature and we encourage everyone to engage actively within the literary community. Through public performances, we bring together groups of people who value literature, not just for its literary value, 
but who see its transformative power both for the individual and society. We believe that stories, poems, diaries, memoirs do, as Seamus Heaney suggests, function as bearers of value. We are also importantly dedicated to printing short-run, high-quality produced titles that are accessible to all. We actively encourage writers, from the serious career-minded to people who write for pleasure, healing, personal growth, insight, or just to inform. And over the years, we have produced a broad range of writing, including poetry, history, memoir, and general prose. Now, often a large proportion of a writer's experience of how they make sense of the world, whether through writing poetry or prose, can be lost to future generations. The Limerick Writer Centre are engaged in recording and preserving those written experiences in what we like to call an art of culture. Similar to Noah's Ark, we wish to take on board literary artefacts which should be wide and inclusive of all types of writing. And like Noah's Ark, we would hope it can survive the flood of time that engulfs everybody and everything and leaving a legacy to enrich future generations. We believe that this is not just a worthy aim, but also an essential one. Left to the vagaries of the modern day market, only what is deemed of literary value by a select few will be preserved for future ages. We take the view that by celebrating all writers equally, and if we have the sensitivity to perceive the value of diverse voices, it will enrich the entire community. Our hope is that by preserving the artifact, adding to the art's precious content, we can also preserve the spirit that sparked this creation, or at least create a curiosity by future generations about their past, which may, in time, rekindle that spark, and like the rainbow, signify a new beginning. So to finish, on two counts, I'm delighted to see so many of you here tonight to support Mike's book. Firstly, it's great that Mike's work now takes its place in that arc of culture, and it, Mike will bring a positive awareness of his locale to a new audience. Secondly, it is through the sale of books like Mike's that we can continue to reinvest and publish new writers. So when you buy Mike's book, you're not only supporting him, but other local writers also. So to conclude, I'd like to thank a number of people who helped to make this occasion a success. I'd like to thank Key Arts, and uh, to Ruth, especially Ruth Jurak for her design of the cover, and uh, to David Rice, who was going to officially launch a book in a few minutes, and to my own colleagues at the Lyric Writers' Centre, Donald Thurlow, Pat McMahon, Jim Burke, Marion Cody, and to Lot Bender for her work in designing the book. Thank you very much. He did struggle for the microphone, but let me tell you, Mike knows him and I know him, and he doesn't like being friends. But Dominic Taylor has almost single-handedly in Limerick um, maintained the tradition of poetry writing. And if you look inside uh, Michael's book, you'll see a piece of writing about him. And it doesn't matter whether it's open poetry evenings at, on the nail or readings in the Hunt Museum. He was the co-founder of the White House Poets and does so much more. So we're all right as writers, very grateful to Dominic. Thank you very much, Dominic. And now we come to introduce David Rice, who's going to launch the book. And, and Mike chose wisely when he asked David to, to launch this book. David is, is a writer of some repute, many of you will know him. But just looking at his CV, it, it, it's so impressive and, and interesting. Um, in the 1970s, he was an editor in Sigma Delta Chi award-winning syndicated columnist in the United States, who returned to Ireland in 1980 to head the prestigious Rathmine School of Journalism, in 1989, amazingly and interesting, he was invited to Beijing to train journalists on behalf of the Chinese government news agency and to work as an editor with China Features. He was in Beijing during the massacre at Tiananmen Square. And this led to two books, Dragon's Blood and the novel Song of Tiananmen Square, which was read for a full week on RTE radio. His books have been published in Britain, Ireland, Germany, Italy and the United States. And David's number one best-selling book, Shattered Vows led to the groundbreaking Channel 4 documentary, Priests of Passion. He now lives in Tipperary. He's taught writing skills at the University of Limerick and directs the now world-famous Killaloo Hedge School of Writing. He's taught writing and editing skills for more than 20 years 
and pioneered his own training techniques. His clients include Trinity College, the University of Limerick, the Irish Times, the Thompson's Foundation in London, the New China News Agency, and, and so many more. I would have to spend a little bit of time reading them. I think David's published eight books, nine books. Is... Can't remember. It's about eight. <laughs> but we're delighted to invite David Rice to come and launch this Save to Memory, Lost to View. the half of that. <laughs> no. Anyway, thank you very much. Uh, okay. Um, first of all, I just wanted to say that we've seen from what, uh, what Donald has said now, um, I, it had been all over the world, and I'm convinced after that that the most beautiful place in the world is Ireland. And the most beautiful part of Ireland, and I'm quite serious in this, is this region, the Killaloo area. Therefore, we live in the most beautiful place in the world. We don't have Alps. We don't need them. Now, the thing is this. Um, this book, Save to Memory, Lost to View, is one of the best introductions to this beautiful area. And as I read it, as a blow-in, well, 20 years ago, that's a blow-in. Um, I mean, I learned, I learned so much about Bird Hill, all the different regions, and I feel now when I'm driving around, wow, now I know what the, that that was a creamery and, and all the different things. So it has educated me. Um, what it has done is, for all of us, or will do for those who get it, and I hope you all will, it will tell you about everything to do with this area through the eyes of a very, very astute uh, observer. It will tell you the story of the region, the history of farming in this region. It will tell you about the creameries and the milk farming. It will tell you about the development, good and bad, from Kilmiston of Bridge to <coughs> M7. Um, which, <laughs> which should not be as much as named among us. Yeah, anyway, and this tells you about the education that the young people in this area went through. Above all, it tells you about the sporting activities in this area because this man is both a sportsman and a writer. And he has, uh, it's just wonderful, particularly to realize that, um, how would I say it, the, the rivalries between the different areas. It shocked me. I thought they were just driving through this town and that town and the other town. But I learned, for example, that Newport looks down on the sporting of Bird Hill. And Bird Hill, and Bird Hill hates Newport. And the scarab is regarded as the boondocks. So, um, I mean, it's, it's just a joy to read. And it gets a new dimension that we never had. I, I mean, the Blowins wouldn't have had it anyway. The locals would, you can be bloody sure of that. <laughs> this is an author who uh, has two gifts, and the combination of these two gifts is a very rare thing. The gifts are to be uh, gifted at sport, and also to be gifted at writing. Those two do not often go together, but when they do, you get somebody like this author and a book like this. Uh, and within the gift of writing, he has two gifts, which is the gift to write prose and poetry. Now that, very, very few people can do that as well. G.K. Chesters and a few others like that. Um, and I can tell you, I know that very few can do it because having written prose all my life, I tried my hand at poetry. And when I read my first poem at, the writer, at our writer's group, there was a terrible silence. <laughs> and then somebody said, well, it, it does rhyme, yes. <laughs> then a friend leaned over and whispered, David, stick to the day job. <laughs> anyway, um, the thing is, and he also has a further gift, which uh, very few people have all these things, uh, of music. Plays the guitar, was a member of the Prodigal Sons, um, it, with his brother Austin now, 
they do a wonderful thing where he provides the poetry and also provides the um, the the music. I mean, where does he get time to read? I do not too sure. But anyway, now in the prose, uh, I just like I just just I I found his skill with words, his taste for words was lovely. He speaks of a rebel without a clue, not a rebel without a call, but a rebel without a clue. Another time, he talks about the wind playing symphonies in the trees. Sorry. He also, um, he talks about the Annus Mirabilis, the wonderful year. And then he says, uh, but back to the Mirabilis part of the Annus. <laughs> that's words, that's a skill with language, there's no doubt about it. And, um, and he, now, he can show, he can write very succinctly about certain things that many of us would not care to remember. I'm going to take the liberty of reading one day, a couple of little passages. This is about corporal punishment in schools that he went through, and so did I. Within the classroom, there certainly was teaching and learning, but the culture of physical punishment was pervasive. We lined up in orderly rows to be slapped for innocent, uh, incorrect solutions to algebra or arithmetic, prom or arithmetic problems, and at times, class time and activity were reduced to the pounding of feet on the wooden floorboards as we queued up for the punishment ritual. There were sadistic men among the teaching cohort, cohort, but much of the slapping was routine and administered without malice. I won't read anymore. I get so angry when I read that because I remember it uh, too well. And I was taught some wonderful men, but I was taught by some Mormons. Uh, mo but morons, I'd say. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry! <laughs> if there's any Mormons here, I do. <laughs> okay. <laughs> anyway, now, uh, and as for poetry, actually, when you read, when you hear these things like the wind playing symphonies in the trees, you realize it's not just a poet writer who's doing this. It's, a, it's not just a prose writer. There's a poet behind the poet writer. Let's, and, and let's just okay, look at a couple of his poems. There's one, a lovely one, where he um, it's in the memory of Pat Jurek. And just listen to this. Do bicycles swoosh and tick in the fog, and distant Galway trains beat rhythms while autumn winds tease melodies from trees? Wish I had written that. <laughs> uh, I give you, uh, there's another one just there. You see it? Uh, this is, um, yeah, this is just the beauty of, you know, how would I explain this now for a minute? Okay, this is one of the greatest skills in writing or in anything creative is to link two things that haven't been linked before. Uh, a very famous writer, I can't think of his name now, uh, wrote a book called the art, of the art of Creation, I think it was. Um, and he said that the ability to bring two separate things together for the first time and a spark flying is the basis for all creativity, um, even in inventions. Like somebody saw once um, a buttonhole and then was walking through fields and things, those little berries stuck to his clothes and he suddenly said, ah, Velcro brought two separate things together for the first time, stickiness, hooks, and buttonholes, and so on. But that is the basis of metaphor and the basis of simile. And he, there's a most beautiful poem here on gardens that <coughs> talks about the lining of uh, furrows in the garden for vegetables and things. And then he, said he makes the jump to writing. And you can see the rows and rows and rows writing. It's like a garden. Placid fingered now at a desktop by the kitchen window, July afternoon. I wrestle with phrases, sentences, words, striving for rhythm, nurturing images, weeding out cliches, latitudes, banalities, typewriting, orderly, orderly rules of verse. There's a garden for you, isn't it? Um, and he's able to weave languages together, I mean, he's able to weave Irish and English together. Just a small bit. We the young gulls stranded beyond the pale, gone ser shagling no galia, wishing we didn't have to stay. How can you move so smoothly from one language to another? Another no smoking, no messing. This is about you know, at Irish College. No smoking, no messing, lights out at ten thirty, no word of English under pain of expulsion, 
knee notch, the veil, the shot, curtailments, restrictions, contentions in scene, scene. Finally, all emotion is in this book. Um, there's sadness. There's sadness. 23, and I think this is, he's got sadness, anger, and love, all between these pages, 23, here we are. This is Requiem for a Housewife. I think I can guess who the housewife is. The warmth that met you at her kitchen door came partly from the standing number eight. A scone she baked were worthy to share plates with bread of heaven. It's a lot more. But the last bit is a prayer. Mary Immaculate, housewife of paradise, put all your grace and know-how to the test. Pot roast on, season and flavour well. Serve a table fit to win a prize that she who knew the way to treat a guest may sit at ease at last and have to fill. Anger. Let's have anger. And I'm nearly finished. Here. I'm here. When, the yellow earth, when the yellow earth movers of the National Roads Authority subsided in the haddies of Anna Holt's bottomless bog, <laughs> the apparatus of the M M7 motorway wreaked a merciless revenge on Garden Hill Tuknokhan, Colleen, and Banyard. There's anger for you. And finally, love. Let's see if I can find love. 75. These things keep falling out of me. 75. Yeah. Where do you hear this? And this, we'll end on the love one. And there would be, it's about a poem about assassins. And and there would be more assassins and near assassins and would-be assassins in Memphis and Cairo and Rome and everywhere, all with their sights on bigger fish than me, until a slight assassin in a mini skirt, killer smile and waves in her hair, shot an arrow from a Ferris wheel at a carnival in Tipperary, bull's eye, straight through my unsuspecting heart. <laughs> many parts, who has been generous enough to share all these gifts with us. Prose, poetry, song, and sport. But the greatest gift so far is safe to memory of us to view, and I great pleasure in watching it. Thank you, David. That was lovely. Thank you very much. Um, I wish I had the book a few days earlier, and I would have been much more careful in choosing the music. Um, is this my phone on the phone? Yeah, um, that we play tonight. Because glancing through this, he's included the soundtrack of my whole life, I think. Um, and when you get the book and you read, um, and the beat goes on, one of the poems, or you read the prose, Sweets to the Sweets, where it includes those of us who are old enough to remember <coughs> the battle, whether you were with Cliff Richard or whether you were with Elvis Presley and so on. And I thought I'd just take the uh, presumption of reading one of the poems. It's called Love and the New Musical Express, the summer of 67. See, can you name all the songs? The happening, the day I met Maureen, her face, a whiter shade of pale, against the Waterloo sunset. Let's go to San Francisco, I suggested. You only live twice. All you need is love, she sighed, then I kissed her. Picked some flowers in the rain, dedicated them to the one I love. Alas, the last waltz. I said something stupid. Silent, not golden, followed. There goes my everything. I'll never fall in love again. <laughs> that was before I met Carrie Ann on the platform at Finchley Central. Hi ho, silver lining. Now even the bad times are good. <laughs> All I need to tell you about this writing and this man is written by Donor Ryan on the back of the book. It's been a lovely experience reading Michael's memoir and the poetry that lines its paths. It's a wonderfully written book, full of humour, warmth, passion and obvious love for family, music, sport, 
language and literature. I wasn't a model pupil, but I'm reminded again how lucky I was with the teachers I had in Nina CBS. Michael Joy. the most the, the turnout. Uh, I was hoping uh, there'd be a few lines of seats half filled. Couldn't, uh, couldn't have anticipated this kind of crowd. And the second thing, of course, the, the words from David and, and uh, Donald. Uh, I don't think I recognize myself in any of that. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, um, I'm thrilled anyway that the, the attendance here, you know, um, represents a big chunk of my life, I suppose, um, neighbours and cousins from Bird Hill, and uh, of course some of the central characters in the whole drama of my life, and Brother Raymond over there. Uh, unfortunately, Austin can't make it tonight, he's not feeling, feeling well. would love to have been here, and he was due to be my sidekick and backup man and everything like that. But, Unfortunately, you can't make it. Um, so apart from our till neighbours and cousins, there's an the extended uh, Jurek clan in all parts. And I'm from Scarif and from Mayout and other far-flung places. And uh, all kinds of reminders of my past. Uh, old schoolmates from Bortil National School. Some of them used to drive white Anglias <laughs> without, without too much success. And, uh, old colleagues from Nina CBS when, when it was uh, located at John's Lane. Uh, some old fellow lodgers and some dingy uh, lodgings in Dublin. And uh, colleagues from CBS and new neighbours from Killaloo. Delighted again to see people from the Kilo Writers Group. Uh, for the first 10 or 15 years, I suppose, of my writing career, everything centered around the Kilo Writers Group. And they gave me the confidence and the platform to, to deliver my work in public. And then the, the Kilo Writers Group kind of folded. And it was a little bit of a, a lag. Um, we all went into hibernation, I suppose, for a bit. And my writing career was revived. I suppose by a combination of the Limerick Writers Centre, the White House poets, that whole writing community in, in uh, Limerick that Dominic uh, spoke so eloquently about. And also my brother's musical collaborations. Um, we started working four or five years ago on a program of poetry and music. A little bit of overlapping and some music leading into poetry and poems leading into music. And we've been lucky enough to be able to deliver that program throughout the Midwest and as far as south as Cork. We haven't gone beyond Ross <laughs> uh, We might break into uh, the pale something. <laughs> so anyway, I'm, I'm thrilled with the turnout and um, thanks for all the, the kind words. Um, I don't believe I'm the writer that Donald, uh, David, the David Rice did. I, I am, but anyway, I'm glad he, uh, he enjoyed the, the read. I hope, uh, hope you all do as well. Um, I'd like to thank again the people who put the book together, Dominic and the Limerick Writer Centre, and uh, Ruth for her cover design and sundry other jobs way beyond the call of duty. Uh, if they're around, they're probably still working on something. Posters or whatever, post launch posters. Yeah, uh, and again to to all um, the support of all my and Mary and the rest of the there will be the non graphic designer element in my family, so Stephen and Lillian and and everything. He's not here either, but, uh, So maybe I'll just read a few short uh, excerpts. The, the intention was that I would read uh, a few short passages and they would lead into poems with uh, Austin's musical. Backing, but as I say, I'm lacking my my sidekick, my going forward who protects my my tackling <laughs> and so on. Uh, so I'll, I'll read I'll read a few uh, short prose extracts and maybe one or two poems. And uh, for those who haven't read anything here, you might get a flavour of what the work is about. 
Um, I had a fairly ordinary childhood, um, unexciting, I suppose. But, so if you're uh, looking for a kind of a sex, drugs, and rock and roll, <laughs> <laughs> I'm probably disappointed. Well, rock and roll, all right, yeah. And uh, yeah, you know, there, is, there is a small bit of delinquency in the. In early chapters, so maybe I'll include, I'll, I'll include some of that. Uh, the first one is, is the, the opening page of a chapter called By the Wayside. Half a mile west of Burt Hill Village, on the margin of the N7, stands Our Lady of the Wayside, where I was baptised in 1949. My parents and a host of my old neighbours lie buried in the adjoining cemetery, at the foot of a steep incline called Chapel Hill, one mile from my childhood home as the crow flies. A crow in no particular hurry might opt for a detour by the Ballyhane Inn, or even go the longer way around to take in the sights of Burt Hill, a village now renowned for its tyrants. My earliest hazy memory of Our Lady of the Wayside is of being carried out of the gallery of the church in my father's arms, after I had been over vocal and insistent in demanding a drink. <laughs> I want tea in my mug, was how I articulated my request to family. The occasion was a night ceremony when the understated lighting heightened the air of reverence and mystery. In fact, many of my childhood memories of church relate to night services, followed by the one mile walk home with my father in total darkness along the straight stretch of road we knew as Canada. When the lights of the occasional passing car flared and receded, they were invariably replaced by a darkness denser and more impenetrable than before. It was in one of those nocturnal treks up Canada that I witnessed my first falling star. Sunday Mass, First Confession, First Communion, and evening devotions put Our Lady of the Wayside at the centre of our public lives. First Communion probably marked the zenith of our state of grace. The poet Roger McGough wrote of being, at that awkward age now between birth and death, well, Confirmation for me came at that awkward age between innocence and street wisdom. When I had one eye on God as represented by the bishop and his crozier, and the other on mammon in the form of the promised confirmation money. <laughs> what happened to all that confirmation money, I'm not quite sure. I certainly didn't save any of it. But in the week that followed, I did spend a portion of it on a packet of gold flake cigarettes, <laughs> which I purchased from Louis Ryan's ramshackle shop across the road from the church, and consumed on the way home, not wisely and not too well. Confirmation had left my soul stainless, but W. H. Wills's yellow imprint was on my fingers, <laughs> and the nausea had whitewashed my face by the time I had hauled my ailing body and troubled conscience through our front door. <laughs> and. Um, so that was one vice from childhood anyway, and another one which I'm not responsible for. I, I just read a, a very short excerpt from the chapter about John's Lane, my secondary school experience. Um, I go back to the beginning and my first day at school, and then we move on to after Christmas in, in first year. It must have been after Christmas when we prepared for the competitive hurling season. This meant the Rice Cup, an under-14 championship for Christian Brother Schools. Most of the squad was drawn from the first year group, but it also included a few big six class boys from the primary school. And that school also furnished us with the team manager and coach, a little brother from Belfast. Maybe there was method in his apparent madness, and he certainly did think outside the box, as the current cliche goes. I had never previously played as a defender, but he installed me in the full back position. And on my left, he placed Noel Shore the most skillful and accurate forward in the team. We suffered a few heavy defeats in warm-up matches, and one of them was on the blessed side of Thurless Sports Field, now Central Stadium, before tackling Ross Gray CBS in the Rice Cup proper. The game was played on neutral ground in Moneygall, and apart from the result, I have two good reasons for remembering the occasion. In the first test of my full-back skills, I challenged the full forward to a low incoming ball, but he got there first, turned and struck. I was within a few feet of his hurley when the ball left it, ricocheted off my cheek and sailed over the bar some 20 yards behind me. There was discomfort, but I played on. 
half time found us well in our ears, and we gathered for the pep talk. Then our coach did something interesting. He produced a handful of pills, gave us one each, and instructed us to take them. It would make us feel better, he said. <coughs> and he certainly did. I still don't know what was in those pills. We didn't win the match, but I played the second half absolutely without fear. As for the risk of injury, I could have turned the other cheek, expected another slitter, and felt nothing. And so, a quarter of a century before Ben Johnson and the Seoul Olympics, I was a 13-year-old consumer of performance-enhancing drugs, <laughs> with only the loss in the first round of the Rice Cup to show for it. <laughs> yeah, I missed the great opportunity at the start of that. I should have dedicated it to Maria Sharapova. <laughs> Or Lance Armstrong. <laughs> okay, uh, part of the original program with, uh, worked out with the brother yesterday was, was a, a, a poem called uh, Kilmistella Bridge. There are a few people here from not very far away from Kilmistella Bridge. And it's a poem we've been doing uh, for a while now. And Austin has a companion piece called Train of Thought, which is a kind of a, like a, kind of a talking railway blues about uh, the trains and the fields of our childhood. But anyway, he's not here to do that. Uh, and by way of introducing the poem, uh, I'll just read a short extract at the beginning of the chapter called Making Tracks. It is my very earliest memory. My father in the house where he was born, taking, us up, taking me upstairs to a room where his father lies in his final repose. I am seeing Gaga, my grandfather, for the last time. We have been holidaying in Kilkee on the West Clare coast, and we have ridden the West Clare Railway, eastwards to Ennis, en route to the funeral in Scarif. This is the temperamental rail immortalised by Percy French, the last narrow ga gauge track of Ireland's passenger system. The year is 1952, the year in which the West Clare Railway is dieselised, and I am two months short of my third birthday. With that occasion accepted, trains do not feature much in my childhood. That is to say, I do not travel much by rail. In fact, I'm nearly 11 when I have my next rail experience. But my brothers and I grew up on a farm just over a mile from a railway line. And the hooting of the 10 to 1 and the 10 to 4 as they chug into Burt Hill Station perils our lunch and tea breaks from the agricultural grind of meadow, tillage field and peat bog. Less than two miles east of the station is a railway bridge, which represents a significant landmark in the topography of my childhood. It is called Kilmestella Bridge, after the local river of that name, and takes the form of an arrow hairpin with black and amber markings on the old M7 National Primary Road. It is a treacherous double bend and has claimed the life of a truck driver in the early 1950s. In time, a new tunnel will be created, the road straightened in the process, and the old bridge, with its little cross to remember the unfortunate truck driver, bypassed and neglected. With the arrival of the M7 motorway, it will be doubly bypassed. But for a time in my life, this bridge marks the boundary of the local and the exotic. From my home village to Kilmestella Bridge, the railway and the road forced by the familiar fields and houses of Cool and Lacken, But beyond those deadly bends is the great big world that throws up remote settlements like Mount Rat, Port Arlington, and Newbridge, and the great metropolis of Dublin. So the railway defines a kind of watershed for me, and the train is not so much a mode of conveyance as a source of rhythm and music, a fanfare, a timepiece in the poem in the Stella Bridge. Beyond the black and amber coil, where death played hide and seek and found, lay far exotic places. Montrath, Dublin, Moscow, Kathmandu. Behind, the station at Burt Hill and home. This was my Rubicon, my Cape Bocado. The 20 to 9 and 10 to 4, throbbed by familiar fields in Coon and Lacken, before bolting into the vast uncharted 
through the eye of Kilmestella Bridge. In time, I grew, horizons widened. The bridge diminished to a thin zigzag, bypassed by engineers, whose concrete tunnel shoulders with ease the grinding juggernauts. I, too, bypassed for years until curiosity led me by the hand to that out of the way meander, now hatching potholes, weeds, and refuse. Below, the rails zoomed west towards Burt Hill. Behind me, Dublin, Rome, Afghanistan. <laughs> Yeah, I think um, I think David or uh, Donal referred to the chapter "Sweets to the Sweet," and uh, there's a lot of music, a lot of music in my life anyway, a lot of music in my childhood, and um, there are lots of musical references in the, in the book. So one is devoted, to, one chapter is devoted entirely to music. It's called "Sweets to the Sweet," and uh, I'll follow that then with one one short poem. That'll be enough for one. I was born with a sweet tooth, and I am still tempted by all kinds of fat-inducing and health-destroying confections. Oh, and two sugars in my tea, please. I am also possessed of a sweet ear. I like my music melodic. I have no problem if it's lively and rhythmic, but it must be sweet. So no jazz or blues for me. No shano singing, no sex pistols, no Hendrix. And no cream unless it comes from the freezer. <laughs> the world into which I was born with a sweet ear was, to put it mildly, a narrow one. I grew up in an Irish Catholic GAA Fianna Fáil Radio Éireann household on a farm in County Tipperary. The dramas of my first decade were played out to a sound soundtrack of Living with Lynch and Take the Floor and the Waltons programme with its parting reminder, if you feel like singing, you do sing <laughs> On Saturday nights, we listened to the breathless tones of Shauna Morakoon hosting Kaley House, and on Sundays to the high-pitched, mild hysteria of Michal O'Hare's match commentaries from Perlis and Clonus and Trope Park. The music had a guaranteed Irish stamp all over it. Willie Brady and Bridie Gallagher Girl from the Joe Lynch and the stone outside Dan Murphy's door. Charlie McGee and his gay guitar. <laughs> and a Brass and Reed band playing out another sponsored quarter hour program with the Bold Fenian Men March Men. Once in a Kentucky blue moon, a different type of song caught a westerly busting in from the Atlantic, or a nor'easter from the Irish Sea, before the Irish airwaves picked it up and whisked it into our living room. Usually it was a novelty item, a one-hit wonder. The Ballad of Davy Crockett, or When Mexico Give Up the Rumba. <laughs> or Tom Dooley, an elegy for a poor boy condemned to die for taking someone's life with a knife. Add in seven little girls sitting in the back seat, kissing and hugging with friends. A hole in the bucket. A pub with no beer, not to mention Delaware by Perry Combo. And goodness gracious me, you've got the picture. When I was ten, my older brother Austin went away to boarding school, and I missed him a lot. But the parting had its compensations. When he came home on holidays, he recounted exotic tales about fellow pupils from far-flung places like Leitrim. There he is. And he brought scrapbooks and yearbooks and copies of Ring magazine. Best of all, he opened for me a door into the wonderful world of the pop charts. The planet populated by Buddy Holly and Del Shannon, the Everly Brothers, Connie Francis, and the Shirelles. Sorry. <laughs> so that's my cue anyway. Uh, the, the, last, the last poem. Um, this wasn't on the program, but, but uh, as a tribute to, to Austin, or my stricken brother, who can't be here, I'm going to read a poem that I, I wrote for him. Uh, he released an album back in the late 90s. I think, uh, 
what's another continent is the name, but I'm not sure. And around that time, I wrote this short poem, which is basically about the, the big musical influences of his life. And uh, it's, it's written in riddles, so maybe if you listen very carefully, you might, you might work out who I'm referring to in some of those, uh, his influences, starting with some of the, the pop and rock people and then moving on to classical and other. His interests, obviously, are, are various. His big, big interest in and ethnic musics from different countries and different uh, continents, and he's interested in classical music, he's interested in blues, and he's interested in the, all the old traditional rock and roll and folk music as well. So you might recognize, the, you might identify some of the, the people referred to here. So it's called The Secret Chord, and he, he usually finishes up after this by doing his hallelujah bit, his inner poem. So uh, you, you, can, you can sing hallelujah if you wish. <laughs> so the secret chord. A trucker out of Tupelo said it rolling. A hibbing prophet blew it in the wind. West coast surfers rode it. Scousers in caves yelled it. A minstrel from Ontario bore it. Quick strumming on a big steel rail. Multitoned it beckoned from white wigged ghosts in organ lofts, from Russian gypsies, Appalachian maids, Spanish strings, a Chinese leotine, a horseman out of cork, a honey boy. What's another continent, another word, in balance with this mystic note, this secret? Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, Michael. That was wonderful. And uh, while I was sitting there, I read some more music ones, you know, transistor days and so on. I'm sure many of us sitting here will recognise 99% of the tunes there. It's great stuff. Just to say, we've recorded this evening, and uh, Dominic and I do a radio program called Between the Pages on LCCR Radio, and, and this will be broadcast eventually, or you can find it on the internet on lccr.ie. And on that you'll also find lots of other things about books and reading and writing, and particularly with the county Limerick, the county Tipperary and the adjoining counties. Uh, we try to give it local donor rides been on with us quite a few times. All that's left for me to say is thank you for welcoming us to this lovely venue. Thank you for turning out for Michael's launch. Thank you to David for a wonderful introduction. And enjoy the evening and safe journey home. Thank you. <laughs>